Hi ladies, I hope you've been enjoying your study in Galatians um, and just seeing how we can better clarify the gospel to be able to share it with our friends and our family and our coworkers. Um, so I really hope your conversations and your study have been encouraging and um, yeah, that you're just learning a lot through this. Um, just a couple quick announcements. Our fall festivals are coming up uh, in October and we need candy. Um, it's our big ask every year, candy, candy, candy. Um, so if you are at the grocery store or Costco or Sam sometime this week and can grab an extra bag and drop it by the church, um, our teams would be so thankful. And I know all the kids would be so thankful too when there's plenty of candy to go around. Um, also speaking of the fall festival, the one at the Grove will be October 11th and we are in need of volunteers. So um, you can go to our website, thegrove.cc register and find the link to sign up to volunteer. Uh, we could use your help and yeah, we'd love to have you serve with us. And then our last announcement, um, we have decided to swap lessons. So this week, right now, following this, you're gonna actually be watching the lesson from week six, which is on Galatians 2, 11 through 14. And then next week we will do week five, which was Galatians 2, 1 through 10, again, which is what we just did last week. I know, kind of confusing, but we have a panel coming up next week, so we wanted you to have the full context of Galatians 1 through 14 um, before we have that panel. So I apologize for any mix-up or inconvenience or if you didn't get a chance to study that, um, but please know that um, this was a one-time deal. We won't do it again, um, but this week will be Galatians 2, 11 through 14, so I hope you enjoy your study together. Okay, let's begin the exam. You'll have to let me know if you can see these words clearly. How does this look for you? Blurry and out of focus. Hmm. How about this one? Still out of focus. Well, perhaps this is what you need. Hello, ladies. I am super excited to be with you worshiping and fellowshipping in your homes. My name is Nicole Robinson, and I get the pleasure of being one of the teaching leaders here at the Grow for Women's Bible Study. We are jumping in today with Galatians 2, 11 through 14, and my lesson is titled, You Can Sit With Us, uh, inspired by this idea that when we walk into places and spaces, I know as a teacher, my first day coming back onto campus, I'm looking for the people People that are my people, those ones that are going to encourage me and get me started. I'm going to avoid those folks who are maybe already counting down the end of the school year on the first day of school. And sometimes we also have new teachers that come into that space and they're not sure who to sit with. And what I often try to do is create a welcoming environment for those folks to let them know that you can sit with us. You are welcome here. But what we are going to see in this chapter is that the uh, Jewish leaders, uh, they do not not create a welcoming environment for those new Christians and the fallout that can occur with that. Um, at the root of this lesson, we are going to really get to see how cultural identity, racial bias, and racial pride um, can be used in a way that can move people away from the gospel. And so as I start this lesson, I want to lean into the discomfort of that, to, to voice it, to put it on the table and say that often lessons from the Bible are uncomfortable and in pure honesty, they should be. Um, they should move us and they should uh, help us understand that discomfort is often how we grow. So before we jump in, I just wanna take a moment to pray for us and for this time together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be able to share in the opportunity to sit with your word, Lord, and to worship you. You are a great and a powerful God, and you work through uh, us in so many ways. And so we just pray that this time together will be a time of revelation. It is a time of refreshment and renewal, but most importantly, a time to study and to know your word. And we pray these things in your precious son's holy name. Amen. Uh, so let's go ahead and open up our Bibles. And I want to take a moment just to read this uh, section. It's short, but I think it will give us a little bit of clarity. But when Cephas, also known as Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when, he came, when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. 
And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? I think that once we become Christians, we want to believe that magically our cultural identity, our biases, our worldly identities just sort of fade away. And we like to say things like we're colorblind and that everyone's the same. And while I think that that is a beautiful concept, it's simply not the way that we're wired. As we start this journey together, just about every commentary that you'll read about this section teases out the racial and cultural and identity and class implications of the text and then also identifies the use of religious policies to control and exclude others. So I come to this prayerfully and I come to this thoughtfully and willing to walk this journey with you um, so that we can live according to the gospel and accept others. I would like you to also consider that this story, uh, consider this story with the perspective that Peter, Cephas, is a man who literally walked with Jesus. And even he was overtaken by his alignment with his own identity and culture. He had a revelation from the lips of God, but he still stumbled in this area. And so it is highly likely that we have not overcome this in 2024. And so this text then also offers us a glimpse of how to resolve biblical conflict in a way that leads us closer to the gospel. It also guides us through how our worldly identity can exclude people that God has already included, already told us that they're in. And push those people away. So if you have not had a moment to take a look at Acts 10, I think it is super helpful just to take a moment to read that and pause me. I'll be right here when you get back. But I think it's important just for perspective so that you can really understand what Peter was told and why then this is so much hypocrisy in his actions and behaviors. So my main point during understanding is that our true commitment should be to the gospels transcending the boundaries of our worldly identities and cultures. So we start this section with a major conflict between two of the greatest names in the Bible. We have Paul and we have Peter. In the Bible, Peter always serves as a representative of the gospel. He's the most famous and well-known apostle. He's a disciple of Christ and the first leader of the early church. And you want to think about Peter like the Kobe Bryant of the situation. On the other hand, we have Paul who is relatively unknown. And so if you can imagine at that moment, think about Paul like the star player in a small town. These two standing side by side, one of them just has a little bit more street cred than the other. And Paul is really better known for his legacy before Christ of a murder of Christians. And so they are in major conflict. And so we see here what, uh, what happens. The message version of our Bible explains it this way. Here's the situation. Earlier, before certain persons had come from James, Peter regularly ate with the non-Jews. But when that conservative group came from Jerusalem, he cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between himself and his non-Jewish friends. That's how fearful he was of the conservative Jewish clique that's been pushing the old system of circumcision. Unfortunately, the rest of the Jews in Antioch church joined in the hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was swept along in the charade. So the issue at hand is false teaching in the church and telling the Gentiles, in essence, that the only way that they could be saved would be to first come under the Jewish law, then after that, they could come to faith and trust and believe in Jesus Christ. And so you have to assume then the identity and the practices of the Jewish culture, and then you can come to faith. And so what they're telling the Gentiles in that moment, at that big meal, at that big celebration in the cafeteria, in the teacher's lounge, they're saying to them, actually, you know what? You're not real Christians. At a deeper level, those men were saying that by not sitting with the Gentiles, that these Gentiles are just not Christians at all. They weren't circumcised, they didn't keep a kosher table, and they are in essence saying, you can't sit with us. 
And see, the environment here, I think, is extremely important. This church is excited that Peter's there. I just told you, it's Kobe Bryant. He's coming to your town. He's going to hang out, go to the potluck, eat the potato salad. Everybody is excited. And they want to hear from him. And I can imagine it would go something like this, like, oh, Peter, please tell us about Jesus. Did you really cut off that man's ear? What was it like to walk on water? And so then in this excitement, in this beautiful environment, where we're all going to fellowship together, comes the rub at verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with them. He was sitting with them. But then he drew back and separated himself. And that's the key. Peter had been fellowshipping with these beautiful people. But when the Jewish church leaders show up, Peter changes. And so my first point is fear often causes us to compromise our faith in God's truth. Peter knew better. Peter approved of God's gospel and ministry when Paul came to Jerusalem in Galatians 2.9, and God used Peter himself to welcome the Gentiles into Christianity without the precondition of being Jews. But see, irrational responses and fearfulness were a pattern in Peter's life. He tells Jesus not to go to the cross. He takes his eyes off Jesus when Jesus asks him to come out on the water. He cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. He has always been prone to act irrationally when under pressure or stress. And so I wanna take a moment as we talk about these words, identity and culture to define them. And for purposes of this lesson, identity is going to be defined as a combination of characteristics, experiences, attributes, or behaviors that make a person who they are. It's also a system of labels that people use to represent themselves that are ascribed to social groups. And identity can include many things, your gender, your ethnicity, your race, nationality, your ability, your re religion, your age, socioeconomic status. And then if we think about culture, these are the customary beliefs or social forms or material traits of racial, religious, or social groups. And so I stand before you, and this is in no particular order, so please don't email. I'm a Christian, I'm pol politically moderate, I'm a black woman, I'm 52 years old, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a 29 year teaching veteran, I'm a dancer, I'm a mentor, I'm a foodie, and all of those things have some type of culture and identity to them. Each one of those identity markers places me in different cultural groups that have their own beliefs and social forms and customs and traits. And I take this time to define these things because our alignment to our worldly identities and cultures can cause fear of other people. Fear of others then causes us to separate ourselves and to go with those who we know and who we're comfortable with. Fear causes us, like Peter, to be unwilling to stand up to God's truth. And so because the Jewish leaders are culturally aligned with Peter, Peter knew that they would somehow be offended, aghast of his fellowship with the Gentiles who had not come under the law. And he'd already ex experienced this offense and the shock of the choice that he started to eat with them in the first place. So in order to please these people, he says, yeah, I'm gonna go over here and sit with you. And maybe in his mind, he didn't think that that action was saying that those Gentiles weren't Christians at all, but this mere act of sitting down with those people said that there was an agreement to the idea that they weren't Christians. And so then our alignment with these worldly identities and cultures then of course causes you to separate. Those visiting Jewish leaders were in Jerusalem, and although this gospel was being preached, they didn't have the opportunity to live it out because for the most part, everyone that they were dealing with was Jewish, and they were still doing all of the cultural practices. This was the moment. This was key. They were going to get to come to the Antioch church and live this out, and you know what they did? They did what was easy, and they did what was comfortable. And so this text overflows with this commitment to racial and cultural pride. These are people who learned their whole lives that the Gentiles are unclean people, and so they use the cloak of religion to hide their hatred or fear or misconceptions about those Christian Gentiles. Cultural differences become more important than the gospel. I'm gonna say that again. Cultural differences in this moment became so much more important than the gospel. 
In Timothy Keller's commentary on Galatians, he says Christian unity takes no account of cultural distinctive, distinctives and is never contingent on cultural similarities. Unity has nothing to do with similarities. And it would seem to me from this text, everything to do with differences. Each year, I have to do a bullying module with my students. And so we go over all the paperwork and we talk about bullying, what it is, and then I ask the class, how many of you in here have been bullied? Just about everyone raises their hand. So then my next question after that is, how many of you are bullies? And sometimes real honest, mostly Christian kids might raise their hand. But for the most part, if I've got a room of 35 kids, 35 hands will go up about the have you been bullied question, but maybe only one or two hands will go up. And I offer this because we know that there is hypocrisy, identity pod politics, elevating certain cultural practices in the church, but none of us is ever willing to say, oh, I do that. We say that others do that, or we might even say that we've experienced it, but we're never the ones that are responsible for it. So often what's happening for a lot of us is we're just going along to get along, like Peter, but God is calling us to be radically transformed, like Paul, to share the gospels all people. So I ask us to consider this. God keeps saying there's no partiality, that I don't show favoritism. The gospel is by grace, not the law, through faith, not works, empowered by the Spirit, not our flesh, for all people, not some, and that there is no other. So I want us to really pay attention to the repetition of this message because I don't know that we're fully getting it. We're not hearing it. We think other people are Peter, but I would offer, what if we all are Peter today? Consider when your actions create legalism. When you say things like real Christians fill in the blanks, homeschool, private school, vote Republican, vote Democrat, don't watch television, only listen to Christian music. In order to recognize the partiality, biases, and legalism in your life, it's essential that you understand who you are. What's your identity? Who do you align with? What are your cultural groups? And how do those things impact who you allow to sit with you? What could have changed the whole situation is if Peter had been an ally in that moment? What could have elevated the gospel and brought people together was simply Peter advocating and sitting down with those Gentiles. It could have changed everything. He could have shifted perspectives in that moment. And it also could have created affirmation and trust for those Gentile believers and offered a new way of thinking for those Jewish leaders because of proximity. Peter could have transformed that whole situation by simply saying, yes, my friends, yes, my brothers, they can sit with us. And so my next point is our choices and vulnerabilities profoundly influence others. And so when we get into verse 13, we see that the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. This behavior led Barnabas to behave the same. Barnabas, who was the pastor, joins in. Can you imagine? Daniel just plopping down at the table. And the rest of the Jews then did as well. David Guzik says the Gentile Christians had just been asked to leave in essence, or were told to sit at their own section away from the real Christians. They weren't allowed to share the same food as the real Christians. Peter, the honored guest, went along with all of this. And Barnabas, the man who led many of the Gentiles to Jesus. Pause right there for a minute. You just offered me this gospel. You just told me what it was. You gave me the truth of it. And when it was time to act out that truth, you went the other direction. The rest of the Jews in the church in, at Antioch went along with it. When we fall or go astray, we often take other people with us. These actions by Peter and Barnabas and the other Jews had lasting effects. And they knew, they knew when they were sitting at that table all together that those Gentiles had already done all the work that God needed them to do, but they weren't putting the gospel into action in their own lives. And so we play hypocrites when our conduct is not in step with the gospel that we proclaim to believe. And so therefore, my friends, 
point three is we must stand boldly for the gospel. And Paul says, I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. And that statement is so powerful. It's convicting. Paul is speaking the truth about the impact of Peter and the rest of the Jewish leaders choices because standing for the gospel is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It had to be public because of the high damage potential. Fractured church, distrust of Barnabas, isolation of the Christian Gentiles, and then standing for the gospel is hard. Paul is calling out somebody who was deemed by the people to be much greater than he is. We must uphold the gospel in every part of our life. And so because of that, and because Paul knew that, because he'd gotten that word directly from God, he knew that he had to move quickly and he had to become a leader in the situation to remind a group of people from the dominant group about the truth of the gospel. And Paul's approach in this moment is what I'm most compelled by and inspired by. And I want to approach this in my life with the same commitment and passion. The first thing that he does, he doesn't go over, he doesn't stick a finger in Peter's face, he doesn't curse at him, he just simply shifts the focus. He says, you've lost sight of the gospel and the profound grace in which you were welcomed into Christ's embrace. And he doesn't focus on the behavior, but he focuses on the truth and the attitudes which led to the grave snub. And then what he does, and this is what I think a lot of us don't do when we're ready to call out the offense, he offers affirmation and dignity. Peter, you're already justified in Christ. And so this frees you from the need to seek validation through national, cultural, racial identities. And so then it's just calling him, reflect on the grace that you've received and contemplate how you can faithfully live out the gospel with these Gentile Christians. But Paul comes into that situation understanding the risks. Saying nothing would support false teaching, would elevate hypocrisy in the church. And then to validate this idea that the Jewish leaders are putting forward, that the saving grace of Jesus Christ was not for the Galatians. And the damage of that is grave. Imagine the Galatians. Imagine the, <laughs> excuse me, imagine them. They're probably thinking to themselves, wait a minute, you guys just moved the goalposts. We thought we were in. This is public disrespect to the Gentile Christians. And even worse, it was a public denial of the gospel. He did it publicly. And so Paul's an example for us here because he's using God's grace as a motivator. Paul's saying to us, live your life in line with the gospel. Christian living requires us to be in a constant state of alignment. We have to ask God to help us calibrate our walk and bring everything that we do in alignment with the truth of the gospel. And we all have beautiful identities and rich cultural backgrounds. But most importantly, beyond all of that, we are God's people. God is not in fellowship with you based on where you live, based on what you look like, how you identify. So we then, therefore, cannot and must not fellowship with God's people in a way that privileges one group over the other. We cannot lose sight of this message, friends. The repetition here is key. So as I close today, I ask you to consider in what ways do national, cultural, or racial pride sometimes conflict with the unity that the gospel calls for? And how can you work to transcend these boundaries, to embrace the diversity within the body of Christ? Because what this passage is telling us is that this church is diverse, but some of the people didn't necessarily want the diversity. How can we begin to work with these imbalances within ourselves, this alignment to go places where it's comfortable and it feels familiar, and then realign those imbalances so that they align with the truth of the gospel? Our identity in Christ is our primary focus. And so I ask you to consider today, who can sit at your table?